Hey everyone, Adnan from Quixel here. In our last video, we've briefly touched on Quixel Bridge and its different LiveLink plugins, which help you connect Bridge to any 3D software or game engine and export your assets with one click. Today, we're going to be looking at one of these plugins, the Blender LiveLink. Since its 2.8 update, Blender has been showing a lot of potential thanks to a revamped architecture and user interface and Eevee, its brand new real-time PBR renderer. In this video, I'll show you how to set up the live link, create a fairly simple scene with Blender's live link and Eevee. To start off, let's go to the downloaded tab inside Bridge and select an asset we want to export. A side panel should open up as soon as you click on an asset and you should see an export settings tab in there. The export settings tab helps you choose the texture format and resolution and the mesh format and its level of detail that you'll be exporting. I'll leave these settings to their default values and set the export drop down to Blender. I'll hit download to download the Blender live link, then click copy to copy this script line and now I'll head back to Blender. Before we do that, keep in mind that all live links have an extensive documentation that you can access by clicking on this question mark button. Now back to Blender, I'll head over to the edit menu, then preferences, and in preferences, I'll go to the add-ons tab. To install a live link, you can simply click on install, then paste the script line we've copied from bridge right here. This should change the default directory to one where there's a zip file. Select the zip file and then hit install from archive. Alright, that's about it. Let's make sure that our live link is enabled, then head over to the import menu to see if it's properly installed. You should see this mega scans live link button added in here, and now just click on it to activate the live link. So now that we have our live link up and running, I'll head back to bridge and click export. Our asset will be visible straight away within Blender and from there we can export as many assets as we want just by hitting the export button. Now let's talk about how Blender's EV Renderer and Megascans can work together. Since EV is a PBR render engine, the textures you get from the Megascans library will work out of the box. To show you that, I've made this simple scene based on our recent ArchViz rendering tutorial and I'll show you how to add your textures and meshes, tweak their settings and your lighting setup. Before we jump in, please check the video's description to download the scenes FBX and be able to follow along. To start off, I'll go in the shading tab to work on this scene. Let's select this wall, go back to bridge and export this concrete slab surface. Next, I'll set the material of my mesh to concrete slab in Blender's node editor. And since I've already unwrapped my geometry, I won't need to tile this texture. However, the floor here was not made to tile by default. So let's apply a dark concrete surface on it. And in the node editor, I'll hit tab and type in mapping, then hit enter. This will create a mapping node, which allows me to tile my textures very quickly. Now I'll set the mapping node to texture, then connect its vector output to the other vector input of my PBR textures. However, you've probably seen that now we don't even have our textures displayed anymore. And that's partly because we need to give our mapping node some coordinates to work with. To do that, I'll hit tab again and write coordinates, then select the texture coordinate node. Since we want our texture to tile across the UV maps, all I need to do is plug the UV output of my coordinate node to the vector input of my mapping node. And now everything should work just fine and I can tweak my texture, repeat, rotate and translate its parameters very easily. I applied that same logic to the other surfaces in my scene and now I'm starting to have a fairly promising result already. Next, I need to add the Roman statues in my scene. So I'll just filter them out in bridge by writing Roman statue 3D then I'll hit export on one of them. I want to move this statue on top of this platform. However, doing this manually would be a pain. So I'll just activate snapping by pressing X or clicking on the snapping icon. Then I'll expand the snapping menu, which by default is set to increment. The option we want here is snap to face. So let's select that and move our object onto the platform. 
Now I just need to import two other statues, place them at the right spot and we should be done with this section. The last object that we need custom materials for here is this mesh, which is an LED light bar. Let's select that object and create a new material. What we need here is an emissive input. So I'll just create an RGB node to give our light a color and plug the color output to the emission input in our main material. You'll notice right away that our object doesn't cast shadows or reflections anymore, but it clearly doesn't look like a light as well. And to fix that, we're gonna have to do a few things here. In order to have an emissive light affect our scene, its photons or light particles need to bounce off the other assets and indirectly light them. This concept of indirect lighting is often called global illumination or GI. And to use it in EV, we're gonna need to add an object in our scene called Irradiance Volume and we'll set its X, Y and Z resolution to 8. Next, we're gonna need to scale it up to cover the whole scene and we should be good to go. Now let's head over to the Render tab, expand the indirect lighting settings and click on Bake Lighting. You'll notice that we have a fairly basic but still promising result and from there you can activate your bloom to make it lighter screen space reflections to reflect the light off of any reflective surface and ambient occlusion to cast shadows around all the crevices in your environment. By default, Blender has the bent normal checkbox checked in the ambient occlusion section and you need to deactivate that in order to get an ambient occlusion without a bent normal. We'll cover these details more extensively in an upcoming live stream, but in short, you can improve your render drastically by bumping up the diffuse bounces in your indirect lighting, activating soft shadows and high bit depth in shadows, and increase your render and viewport samples to something like 128. You've probably noticed that before we've added any lights in the scene, our scene wasn't pitch black, which means that there was some lighting going on. That lighting comes from the background, which is a gray environment that acts like an HDRI or high dynamic range imaging. An HDRI can be a color or high quality image that acts like a global lighting environment for your scene. And when working on environments, I highly recommend that you always use one. To create an HDRI in Blender, we can go to the node editor and change its mode to world. Now you can see this color node that I was talking about and tweaking it also affects our background color and lighting as you can see. I'll hit tab on my keyboard then enter environment texture. An HDRI is an image but not just a random image. It usually comes in a high quality .hdr format and to load that file in Blender you need an environment texture instead of an image texture node. Next, I'll just plug it to the surface input and my background will automatically change. I can feed it to a bright contrast node to control its brightness, but as you can see, the process is pretty straightforward from here on. And finally, I've added a sunlight and two area lights in my scene, tweaked the roughness of my materials by leveraging the bright contrast node and baked my lighting again. And that should be it for this tutorial. I hope you've enjoyed this video and don't forget to tune in on Friday at 7 p.m. CET for another live stream where we go in depth into Blender's EV and Cycles. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next time.